Rick Astorian and I are going to split the first lecture and talk to you about the extracellular matrix in animals. You've heard about it in plants from Ram and um, Lucia to some extent. Um, this, unfortunately, our lectures are unfortunately two lectures that um, we strongly suspect you're going to tell us are out of sequence and should have been given much earlier in the week, but um, uh, but let us know about that. But anyway, I, I think it's, um, unfortunately, Trina's talk yesterday was originally scheduled for Friday and she couldn't make it, and this, this would have been a, these would have been good lectures to have before hers. But anyway, I just want to talk to you about the animal ECM, and um, uh, the main point that I want to, I want you to take away from this is that the ECM and the water within it, which is very important, are really major, major components of tissues. And that goes for both plants and animals. Um, I was going to ask if anyone could see the giraffe and the tree in this picture. But um, uh, the point of this picture, this is from um, Gray's Anatomy in 1918. Um, and you can see this, the cells, which are the little little dot, the little structures with dots. But you can see how much matrix there is in this um, rab, young rabbit subcutaneous tissue compared to how many cells. Um, and the point is that that matrix makes up a very large amount of the volume of most tissues. It's quite variable, but even in the brain, which is a relatively non-matrix um, intensive tissue, the volume is uh, uh, um, 10 to 20 percent made up by um, by matrix. Matrix is incredibly heterogeneous between tissues and within tissues in different states of a tissue and it's incredibly dynamic. So you should really think about the matrix as I don't want to say living system but it is a very changeable and reactive system and it's a really critical determinant of tissue properties and I'll just give you a couple examples. For example, um, the elasticity of your skin, of your vessels, and of your lungs. And If you think about all those um, all those parts of your body, you need elasticity in, in all of them. That's determined by the extracellular matrix. The strength of your bones is determined by bone matrix. Even in the cornea, and I'll show you a picture in just a minute, the transparency of the cornea is completely dependent on matrix organization in the cornea. So it's a really, it's a very important in determining tissue properties. And this just gives you, um, I just wanted to give you a very brief survey of what some um, some different kinds of ECM structures you find in normal tissue. So this right here is um, uh, a picture of the basement membrane. And you can see the basement membrane is a very, very well organized lattice. I mean, this is obviously a cartoon, but a very organized lattice. And actually, Ram, if you're here, you showed a picture during your lecture of a plant matrix organized that looked like just like the basement membrane picture. Yeah, I, 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 I was going to say the first few slides and comments that you've made so far about the heterogeneity and how the composition uh, uh, contributes to tissue property, level properties. I mean, that's all exactly the same in plants. Yeah, but what is this basement membrane? You had a picture that looked exactly like this of something in the plant, and I, I just yes. couldn't remember it. That was uh, just a gen generic kind of cartoon of the cell wall, you know, with the cellulose okay. microfibrils kind of representing, I guess here you have laminin. I can't see what that big red, uh, is that collagen type four? Uh, yeah, and I'm going to yeah. go into more detail on this, yeah, but, okay. but it's a it's a mixture of collagens, proteoglycans, other linker proteins. Right. And so this is, it's very highly organized in the basement membrane. This is what epithelial cells, for example, in, in ducts or in things like the gut, they sit on this basement membrane that separates the, you know, it really is a way of separating. Um, you have, you know, these are polarized cells, so they have a top and then a, a basal or bottom layer that sits on the basement membrane. So it's very similar to a cell wall. This is a picture of the submucosal space. In this case, it's of a duct, but it would be applicable really to anywhere, almost anywhere in the body that had a submucosal space. And in this case, collagen fibrils are stained in pink. And you can see that there are very dense fibrils, but there's space in between, and actually this is um, an interstitial, uh, a large interstitial space that has fluid flowing through these very, very large collagen bundles. This is a smaller interstitial space. It's not the greatest picture, but the picture I found had all these threats attached to it about public use, and um, Jess Titel is staying with me, and she and my husband were like, no, 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 you can't show that. So. Um, so anyway, this is um, this little space right here where I've, highlight, I've highlighted with the red arrow is an interstitial space between two cells. This happens to be in the liver, but it, it would be the same anywhere. And you can't really see it because it's not blown up. But in this space, there's a lot of matrix, and that determines how fluid flows between these two cells, fluid and other materials, because of all this matrix that, 
you'd have to do much, much higher magnification to see. Um, this is a picture of collagen fibrils in the cornea, and you can see that there is a really beautiful array, um, a very regular array, and that these um, fibrils are all the same size. And there are certain mutations, um, mostly of small proteolite glycans that lead to irregularity of both the organization and the size of these fibrils and those corneas are not transparent so that just gives you some sense of um, of how critical matrix is to the cornea which you might not have thought of otherwise um, this is just an EM a very highly magnified EM about 200,000 times um, magnified of the glycocalyx um, or um, on the edge of uh, the villi on a duct um, it's this region, this fluffy region right here. So this is on the apical surface of an epithelial cell. On the basal lateral surface, you'd have the, um, the uh, basement membrane. And here you have a number of matrix proteins, including mucins and glycoproteins, that are actually protecting, um, protecting the apical surface of a cell, and that counts as matrix two. And here's just a picture of cartilage, and it shows that there's a very large component of matrix in the cartilage. I mean, you can see these cells shown here, but, um, but you also have uh, the chondrocytes, but you also have um, a very, very important component of matrix in the collagen. So these are all just different normal structures. I mean, I could have come up with 100 other structures and pictures, but I wanted to give you some idea of the variety of the matrix. You can also see um, the ECM is also critically important in pathology, um, and I'm just giving you two, um, two uh, general examples here. One is the tumor microenvironment or the cancer microenvironment. Um, this is a, a pancreatic cancer. No, actually, sorry. This is the pancreatic cancer. Um, these purple structures are the actual cancer itself. But pancreatic cancer is very desmoplastic, is the term used. And that means there's a huge matrix component. And that's all that area outside of the pink right here. In some cases, in pancreatic cancer, you can't even find the cancer cells. You just find this big glob of matrix. Um, this, is, uh, this is a breast cancer cell. And the um, the stain here is, uh, is um, for Versican, which is a large proteoglycan. I'm going to tell you what that is in a minute. But this just shows you that you have um, really this huge component of matrix in between all these cancer cells. And so the matrix, even if it's deposited by non-malignant cells, is an extremely important part of cancer. So keep that in mind. In fibrosis, which is the response to an injury, there is um, typically a very large amount of abnormal extracellular matrix deposited. I'm just giving you a few examples here. This is a liver, and all this dark pink stuff is matrix that's completely abnormal. In a normal liver, you just see this light pink for cells. This is cirrhosis, where you have all this matrix organized in a way that makes blood flow very, um, very abnormal. and um, uh, it, and it's, it's usually that those blood vessel abnormalities because of the matrix that lead to um, the death of these patients. This is a scar on someone's neck, and the scar tissue is extracellular matrix, um, uh, which is it's both important for healing but also um, uh, can be abnormal and cosmetically difficult. This is a patient with muscle fibrosis. This is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. You can see the muscle fibrils here in the purple, the dark purple. Um, normally, they would be right up against each other, all these muscle fibrils, but in this case, there's a huge amount of fibrosis. That's um, It's collagen. It's the light, um, light purple in between the muscle fibrils. So it just gives you some idea of how the ECM is really important in pathology as well as in um, uh, normal tissues. So there are a couple things I want you to think about today as I go through this lecture, which I'll do quickly. Um, one is, please think about this, about scale, about the size of different molecules of the ECM relative to each other and relative to the size of the cell or vessels. And think about what cells are actually sensing in the matrix. Are they sensing mechanics, which is, yes, in some cases, are they sensing topography? And I've shown you a number of different pictures down here showing how um, the scale at which you look at the matrix gives you different topographies. So this is... Um, uh, this is uh, a cell in a blood vessel. The cell right here, you can see the outlines by the yellow um, arrowheads here. And then the asterisks here are the matrix. And you can see when you, ex when you blow up the picture, when you go up to higher magnification, you can see just how heterogeneous and, and varied the um, topography of this particular, um, this particular matrix is. Here are three other examples, highly magnified of the cornea, the intestine, and um, uh, oh, this is just matrigel, which is a common um, matrix used in the lab, just showing you how variable that 
um, topography can be. So think about what cells are actually sensing, because this is really what your cells are lying on. You can think of it as, you know, a nice smooth layer of collagen, but that's probably not what it looks like either in a tissue culture dish or in an organism. And then think similarly about the appropriateness of the culture system that you're using um, and the matrix proteins that you're using and how close are you to the organization and topography of matrix in your system and mechanics as well. And so the last thing is think about the mechanical import of the matrix proteins in your system. How do the proteins and their conformation affect the mechanics of the system and vice versa? For example, fibronectin on plastic becomes incredibly stiff. Um, uh, and those are all very important. You know, we all sort of um, less and less, but it, um, the field in general tends to use tissue culture plastic in a knee-jerk way, um, and, um, but that has very important mechanical implications for cells and for the matrix that they're on. So um, the um, matrix has a number of different functions. Previously, people thought about matrix as really sort of the a static architecture, architectural feature of tissue, but we now know that even in the architect, even the architecture, um, architectural components and functions of matrix are not static, and that matrix also has a significant signaling component. So there are a number of architectural functions of matrix. Matrix provides strength resilience and resistance to compression. I mean, think about it. You guys are all sitting. Presumably, your entire body is not squishing because you're sitting on it. Um, and that's very important. That's because of the extracellular matrix in your body. Um, and similarly, um, yeah. Um, matrix also provides a very important component of volume um, to the tissue. It's, uh, um, there's um, space filling is taken up by matrix, and that's going to be very important in the structure of, of tissues. Um, and along with that comes water retention and buffering. Um, so that's all provided um, by the architectural functions of the matrix. We talked a little bit about the um, topography, um, but there's um, not just at a, a very sort of um, nano level, but also at um, larger levels, there's significant organizational complexity to the matrix. It can be um, in isotropic in very important ways. Density can vary, um, or in, um, uh, and that's all very important to the function of the matrix. Um, additionally, it regulates diffusion of fluids and solutes. It also serves as both a migration substrate and a barrier for cells. There's increasing amount of, uh, of research being done on this topic. Peter Friedel, who I think is on our external advisory board for the center, really does some beautiful work on how cells, um, cancer cells, migrate along um, different um, sort of matrix paths. Um, as, they're, um, as they're undergoing metastasis. And finally, the matrix serves as really a scaffold um, and an anchor uh, for cells and for other components of tissue. I mean, we looked at the basement membrane, which is a very important anchor, but there are other components of the matrix that serve that similar serve a similar architectural function. Signaling, and this looks like a small list, but these are actually um, real whopper of functions. First of all, um, the ECM is a ligand for integrins and other receptors, and Rick is going to talk about this in detail. But the ECM molecules can also serve themselves as receptors and co-receptors for growth factors, so they're both ligands and receptors. Additionally, they can sequester and target growth factors. A number of the growth factors in your body or the soluble factors aren't just sort of floating around um, randomly hitting receptors. They're actually secreted into the matrix. They may be in a, um, an inactive form. They bind and are sort of stored in the, in the extracellular matrix, and then they're activated um, at future points. For example, TGF-beta, um, which is one of the most potent growth factors in the body, is secreted in a latent form, it, um, it is adherent to the matrix, and it takes sort of cells interacting with the matrix to release um, the active form of TGF-beta. It's actually, um, if you have a chance to read any of the papers by Boris Hintz on this, they're actually, they're, they're really, really cool. So just keep in mind that the matrix has both functional and structural complexity. It's, um, it's a very dynamic system, and it's doing a lot um, uh, in the body, in, in tissues all the time. So this is, this is a complicated slide, and I just wanted to make the point that people are now starting to map out what's called the matrosome. 
or the um, really um, all the proteins that seem to be associated or are, are, that are part of the matrix. This is um, this has really been led by Richard Hines at MIT, and this is a figure from one of his papers. And a number of groups now, but led by the Hines group, have taken a combined proteomics and bioinformatics approach to look for you know all of the matrix proteins in 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 uh, different in, in the body and different organisms different um, and in different uh, tissues um, and they've identified more than a thousand proteins that are associated with the matrix and those include hundreds of um, what they call the core matrisome those are sort of the big three the ECM glycoproteins and I'm going to talk about these in just a second collagens and proteoglycans but also these matrisome associated proteins that include um, uh, uh, more unusual type of matrix proteins that include regulators of the ECM, crosslinkers, degradation proteins, and so on. But just keep in mind that there are there are really hundreds, and, and actually I think they have more than a thousand of these different proteins that are in and, and components of the matrisome. Um, and they found it's highly variable between tissues. Um, uh, normal tissues in a body, but also normal versus tumor tissues. Um, and just one thing to note is that um, you can roughly divide matrix proteins into proteins that are important in the basement membrane and proteins that are important in the interstitial matrix. I wouldn't make too much out of this division, but that's one sort of crude way of dividing um, different matrix proteins. So um, I, I talked about scale earlier, um, and I just want to highlight, um, I think this is graphically, this is just a terrible picture, but it makes an important point, and I haven't been able to find any better, any better um, representation of it, but it makes the point of how um, different matrix proteins are really quite different sizes. So this is a representation of what fibrillar collagen, which you've all heard about, looks like, um, and then this shows you um, hyaluronic acid, how much larger that is in scale. Um, then, um, um, and this this is the whole the the general scale for all these proteins would be 100 nanometers. So it just gives you some sense of the scale of matrix proteins. So now I want to go through the big categories of um, the major structural the major proteins in the matrix. Um, that includes the three categories: the major structural proteins, which is the collagens and elastins, the adhesive glycoproteins, which includes um, fibronectin and laminin, and then the glycosaminoglycans and proteoglycans. So the collagens, um, there are 28 of them, um, uh, and they are, they're notable for these gly, um, glycine XY repeats where X and Y are proline and hydroxyproline. Um, and what, what happens is this is a single chain of collagen where you can see the tiny glycine right here and then the proline and hydroxyproline. Um, and what um, three of these change will form a very rigid triple helix, and you can see it, it's able to tightly pack due to the glycine, and it's stabilized by hydroxyproline. There's also quite a bit of hydroxylysine in collagen. Um, collagen undergoes very significant post-translational modifications that I'll show you in the next slide. Um, and there, there are just um, important to note that there are multiple families of collagens, and they're really divided based on the presence of these collagenous and non-collagenous domains. And there are also there are similar um, there are similar proteins in the plant cell wall uh, that have some some very similar um, very similar domains. Collagen is the most abundant pro fibrous protein in the ECM, um, so that's why you hear so much about it. Um, oh, so there are four families, roughly speaking: the fibrillar collagens, um, which are ma the main part of the interstitial stroma; the network-forming collagens, and I'm going to show you pictures of these in a minute that are part of the basement membrane; and then these other more unusual kinds of collagens. And I'll just show you a couple pictures of them that can form varied um, and sort of interesting structures. So these, the pictures I'm going to show you, they're way, way too detailed, but but I, I just want to make a couple key points. So. Um, uh, uh, and, and I just I sort of liked the way these these pictures were laid out. So the fibrillar collagens, these are the ones, but the ma the major ones are collagen one, which is what we mostly think about when we think about collagen um, uh, in the interstitium. Collagen two, um, which is in uh, bony structures, bone and cartilage. I'm not a bone and cartilage person, but um, <laughs> collagen three, which is also in the interstitium, and collagen five. So those are the main ones. Most of them are heterotrimers, so we talked about those three, um, three uh, strands come together to form a rigid triple helix, although some of them will be homotrimers, most are heterotrimers. Um, and when these are synthesized, the, um, uh, uh, if you just look here, um, 
you have uh, the three the three chains come together, form a, a fibril, and then you have processing of the N and, and C terminal ends, leading to a, a full assembly of the um, uh, of the fibril. Um, and then these fibrils, if you look down here, will form um, will self assemble. Um, into fibers. These fibers are cross-linked by um, members of the lysyl oxidase family, um, and you end up with very, um, very thick fibers. These fibers are often um, heterogeneous. They, in other words, they may have collagen one, collagen three, and collagen five, for example. Um, yeah. Um, where does this like nucleation? Where does this happen in terms of like inside the cell versus outside the cell? Yeah. So. Um, uh, this all happens inside the cell, and you guys, um, and most of most of the the um, much of the post translational processing happens during secretion. Is that that's correct? There, there's a beautiful diagram I can give you the reference from this guy Mitsuo Yamauchi that shows exactly where everything occurs. But much of it, it it's. It, it always bothers me because people talk about, oh, we'll just add lysyl oxidase to the system and cross-link everything. But I believe that occurs um, during the process of secretion or, or very early after secretion. Um, so, so this is all sort of occurring. All of these events are occurring around the time of um, uh, within the cell or close to the cell mem membrane or just post-secretion. But I'll give you that reference because it has really cute diagrams. I, I, I'd taken them out, but, but I shouldn't have. Um, and this just shows, um, I just wanted to highlight one feature of this kind of collagen, which is that it forms fibrous networks. Um, the fact that these collagen fibrils are cross-linked, um, it, it, allows, it allows it to form a network. And this network is very important for long-range force transmission between cells. Vivek Shinoy in our center has done a huge amount of work. Um, this is just a figure from one of his papers showing that cells can communicate over very, very long distances by... Um, um, through the matrix, but that what is required is that the, the matrix have formed a fibrous network. So you have a real network of, um, you, you have a network of matrix. Um, so just think that, that, that the cross-linking and the fact that there's network formation um, is very important in this long-range communication um, between cells and um, uh, in a tissue. So the second kind of collagen is the network forming collagen. Um, the most notable one is collagen four. Um, uh, which is the basement membrane collagen. And this is just um, gives you some sense of the kind of network that collagen 4 forms. It's like a chicken wire. Um, this forms the basement membrane. You also get um, collagen 6 um, forms these tetramers. Uh, I think it's collagen 6, um, uh, which is referred to as beads on a string. And this is a very important collagen in anchoring cells um, to different structures. Um, collagen 8 um, forms these nice tetrahedral and um, hexagonal lattices. And this is associated with basement um, elastic fiber and also with the basement membrane. The point here is just to get some sense that in this other family of collagen, um, of collagens, you don't get these big fibers, but instead you get these networks that are very important in giving structure um, to different components of tissues. Um, <clears throat> and the facet collagens, I just wanted to show you one picture here about just how varied these facet collagens can be. Um, particularly, um, they associate with the surface of fibrillar collagens and are very important in aiding matrix organization. Um, and here's just a picture, um, here's an EM picture and then a cartoon showing that collagen 9, which is one of these facet collagens, links to these big, um, these big collagen, fibrillar collagen bundles and can be very important in sort of higher level organization. This is a type 2 collagen, which is one of the fibrillar collagens um, in this particular case. Um, so the other big structural protein in addition, or family in addition to the collagens are the elastins. The elastins provide resilience. You can think about um, if your skin is lacking elastin or um, is elastin poor, it's going to be very saggy. There's a, um, a human disease that can um, called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome that can um, that that features that. Um, it's also a major component of the arterial vasculature. So if you don't have elastin, you're going to have a, um, a problem with your arterial vascular. 
potentially. It is, um, I like this figure, it's five times more extensible than a rubber band. Um, so it's really, it's, it's quite extensible. Um, and it's it intertwined with collagen fibrils. So in this picture, the black is elastin and the other, um, the, the sort of orange and the red are collagen fibrils. This is in the dermis of the skin. So you can see that they're really quite mixed together. Um, elastin binds to collagens and to proteoglycans and it's also quite protease resistant. So, um, uh, just a couple things about the structure of elastin. It is rich in proline and glycine, um, uh, like, um, like collagen, although it's organized quite differently. Um, there's no hydroxylysine. Like collagen, it's highly cross-linked um, covalently by these lysyl oxidase um, enzymes. Um, and the chains have both hydrophobic and um, alpha helical parts. I'm just showing you, uh, showing you a little cartoon here. Elastin is covered by sheaths of microfibrils um, uh, um, of fibrillin that help stabilize the elastin. So when we think of elastin fibers, there's elastin and fibrillin as well. Um, and this is all very involved in TGF beta activation. TGF beta, as I told you, is one of these important growth factors in the body. Um, so the second big component of uh, matrix proteins are the adhesive glycoproteins. Um, so these are proteins that um, are important in adhesion, and they're also glycoproteins, which means they have sugars attached. Um, the laminins are, um, I'm just showing you a cartoon here. These are trimers, um, heterotrimers, and they're very important in the basement membrane. So with collagen-4, they're one of the big components of the basement membrane. They bind to other matrix proteins that are important in the basement membrane, including nitrogen and perlican. Um, uh, and tenacins, um, tenacins are also in this family. They also have multiple domains. They bind to fibronectin, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, and they bind to mo multiple other matrix proteins. These adhesive glycoproteins bind to and connect a lot of other different matrix proteins, so they're very important in matrix organization. So fibronectin is an incredibly interesting protein. It's an adhesive glycoprotein with multiple domains that I'll show you in the next slide. They bind cells, they bind it binds collagen, it binds heparin. Um, fibronectin, it's interesting because it's organized very significantly by cells after it's deposited. Um, it's required for collagen organization, and this interaction is mechanically regulated. I don't have time to go into details, but, um, but I just wanted to make, you know, this is mechanobiology, um, Center for Engineering Mechanobiology wanted to make the point that there are there's a lot of mechanics in the interaction between different matrix proteins, including fibronectin and collagen. It is highly extensible and becomes extremely rigid if it's extended. This is really nice work from a woman named Viola Vogel um, in Europe. Um, and that's just important to know um, it, that, that, it's, that it has those mechanical properties. There are two forms, um, uh, the product of alternative splicing, plasma fibronectin, that's probably what you all use um, in your experiments if you work with fibronectin. It's, these are soluble disulfide-linked dimers. They're produced exclusively by hepatocytes in the liver, and then they're soluble and are, um, and are in this uh, in the circulation. Cellular fibronectin, which is from the same gene, but it's alternative splicing, is highly insoluble. Um, it's produced by most kinds of cells, particularly in during development and injury. And it is organized by cells um, via integrins. It's a very complex cell-associated arrays, um, and, and it's very important in collagen organization at that cellular level. So this is just a picture of fibronectin. The point I just want to make is that it has really multiple domains. Um, uh, um, uh, different kinds of modules, and it has these binding domains for heparin, for collagen, for cells, um, uh, for fibrin. Um, so a very complex and multifunctional protein. Um, I just want to skip that. So the third big category are the glycosaminoglycans, um, and these are um, uh, these are um, the glycosaminoglycans themselves. Actually, I just want to see what my next slide is. Um, so the major glyc um, glycosaminoglycans themselves are polysaccharides. They're typically repeating disaccharide units um, that um, may be sulfated, um, and they're incredibly negatively charged. So um, uh, um, 
you can imagine that they're going to be very important in, um, in tissues that undergo compression because of that negative charge. They're going to, um, they're, um, they hold a huge amount of water. They're binding to a very large amount of water. And so that's going to be very important in space filling and resistance to compression of tissues. Um, they occupy an extremely large area. And I just want to show you some pictures. Oh, this is just an example. So, um, Hyaluronin is, um, is a glycosaminoglycan. It's not sulfated and it, and it exists without being attached to a protein. So very important, particularly in the tumor microenvironment, although certainly it has functions beyond that. Um, uh, these other um, glycosaminoglycans are all cell associated. So they're, they bind to a protein and that makes the protein a proteoglycan. These are the glycosaminoglycan moieties. Um, and you can see they're re repeating um, uh, they have um, uh, most of them are sulfated, and they're repeating um, uh, repeats of, of different um, different pairs of subunits. Typically, um, the big ones are called chondroitin sulfate, dermatin sulfate, heparin sulfate, um, and large amounts of this will form heparin. Um, but this is heparan sulfate and keratin sulfate. Um, so just to go back to um, hyaluronic acid, um, and this, I just really love this picture because it gives you some sense of just how big hyaluronic acid is. Um, it is not protein attached, it's not sulfated, but it's enormous and it really, um, it can, it holds a huge amount of water. So we talked, um, I think it was during Trina's talk yesterday about hyaluronic acid being used for cosmetic applications, and you can see why it's really a space filler if someone needs, you know, their cheek plumped up or something else cosmetic, you can see why hyaluronic acid would be, um, would be such an attractive, um, such an attractive molecule for doing that. Um, so just keep in mind the scale of some of these proteoglycans. The other proteoglycans include the interstitial proteoglycans. These include what are called the slurps. These are small leucine-rich proteoglycans, lumican, fibromodulin, um, decorin, and biglycan. Um, these are, um, see if they're here. Um, here, they're down here. Um, they're very small. They might have one or two glycosaminoglycan chains. These are just parenthetically are very important in organizing collagen fibrils. So if you knock these out, those very nice arrays of collagen in the cornea will be abnormal. Um, there are also um, the basement membrane protein, uh, proteoglycans, and that includes perlican shown right here. Um, that is part of the basement membrane along with lam laminin and collagen-4. And then you have, um, uh, sorry, also in the interstitial proteoglycan category are the big proteoglycans in the agarcan family. Here's agarcan, versican would look similar. These are proteoglycans are, that have um, very, very large numbers of glycosaminoglycan chains. So you can imagine they're also, like hyaluronic acid, um, very significant in terms of space filling. Um, and then there are membrane brown membrane-bound proteoglycans. Um, the syndicans um, are uh, receptor, are cell surface receptors. Um, the glipican, which is shown here, the glipicans are linked to the membrane by um, uh, a, a GPI anchor rather than a transmembrane um, protein domain. But these are all proteoglycans. So it just gives you some sense of the breadth of proteoglycans in the body. Um, oh, I just wanted to show you this picture of um, the small leucine-rich proteoglycans. Um, this is this is a co normal cordia, and this is a normal uh, rat tail tendon, I believe. And this is when you've knocked out one of the um, small leucine-rich proteoglycans. You can see that the collagen isn't nearly organized as nicely, or in is such uniform fibril size. Um, so it just um, this it's thought that these are very important in regulating um, not just the size and the heterogeneity of collagen, but also its mechanical properties. So um, just a couple more slides. Um, I just wanted to show this slide um, uh, blown up a little bit. This is just a cartoon of the basement membrane. And just to emphasize that um, as the small leucine bridge proteoglycans in the previous slide are important in collagen organization, so proteoglycans are very important in basement membrane organization. Um, uh, perlican, which is this right here, is a, um, is a proteoglycan. And you can see that that's, it's a very important component of the organization of this lattice that includes um, collagen 4 um, right here uh, in red and also includes laminin, this, uh, this heterotrimer shown in blue. Um, so you just get a sense of, of how organized this basement membrane is and how complex it is. Um, 
So I just wanted to devote one slide just to give you some sense of the complexity of regulation of the ECM and particularly its breakdown. So there's a whole family of um, proteases that break down the ECM. The main enzymes are the MMPs or matrix metalloproteases. These are um, secreted as zymogens and are then activated. Um, obviously, you wouldn't want your um, matrix metalloproteases to be um, sort of... Uh, uh, um, active all the time, given how important the matrix is. You don't want um, you don't want you know your collagen to be um, constantly being broken down necessarily. Um, so these enzymes are secreted as zymogens and are activated um, when necessary. Another category are the atoms, the um, uh, a disintegrin and metalloprotease, and the atom TS, um, uh, which are the atoms with thrombospondin domains. These are shed aces. They're also very important in degrading matrix proteins. This is a highly regulated process. There are another set of proteins called the TIMPs, or tissue inhibitors of metalloproteases, and how the MMPs and the atoms and the TIMPs are all regulated together um, in complex ways determines whether or not you have ECM broken down. So I, I just, um, obviously, um, I, we don't want you to know the details, but just to give you the sense that this is a very complex and highly regulated system and that these proteases are quite specific for matrix proteins. Um, so um, in just my next to last slide, um, last night um, uh, when I woke up at two in the morning as my cat was chasing a mouse around the bedroom, it occurred to me, I, um, uh, after I dealt with that problem and I was just thinking through this lecture in my head, it occurred to me I should include something about the mechanics of individual ECM molecules. And I just want to take, you know, really two seconds to go through this just to highlight that these, um, these individual ECM um, molecules have very interesting mechanical properties that are not necessarily reflected in the bulk mechanics of tissues. And those of you who are doing the final project on tissues, I hope have started to think about this a little bit. But I just wanted to show you these three graphs to make, um, make this point. So the first graph here is just showing you um, polyacrylamide, which is a, um, a linearly elastic. And it just shows you that um, as you alter axial strain, this here in the red, the uh, the storage modulus does not change. This is collagen, on the other hand, um, and as it undergoes um, tension, it gets much, much stiffer. So you can see this here. We're going from zero. This is um, compression, and here's tension right here. This is all from Paul Janmay's group, these, these graphs right here. Um, you can see that collagen gets much, much stiffer. These are graphs from Viola Vogel's group um, looking at fibronectin, and you can see that fibronectin also gets much, much stiffer um, as you apply um, tensile strain, um, but that it's really, it's like collagen on a lot, a lot of steroids. Um, it can be extended um, uh, up to 800% and not break, and it gets unbelievably stiff, really at the megapascal, um, at the megapascal range. I included here a quote from the, the Vogel paper abstract, which I thought made um, the very interesting point about how these fibers, how they can be extended so much and how they um, they get incredibly stiff. So this is, this is just really not even a taste of individual ECM mechanics, but I just wanted to make the point to you that, that these biopolymers do have very interesting properties, that these properties are undoubtedly important to the properties of tissues, but that there are very complex interactions between cells and the matrix in determining tissue mechanics. That makes sense. So finally, um, just the take home messages that you really can't think of cells and tissues without thinking about the ECM. Um, so a lot of times when we put cells, you know, we just smack them on a tissue culture dish. Um, that's really, it's, I mean, everything is an artificial system, of course, but, um, but it would be, you really need to think about what ECM molecules they're on, what the mechanical properties, the topology or topography of the ECM is in that setting. There is extraordinary heterogeneity across the ECM um, in individual tissues in specific states. I hope that my initial slides made that clear. Um, and the ECM is really multifunctional, and it's not just, uh, it's not just the building materials. Um, it really has roles beyond that um, that are quite dynamic. And the scale is very important when you think about individual ECM molecules, particularly think about those proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans and just how, how large they might be. But also think about um, 
uh, you know, what an individual cell and, um, you know, very small, um, say, focal adhesions of a cell are actually sensing when it comes to the, the matrix, because it may not be what you're thinking when you look at very low power um, at the matrix. And finally, I, I wanted to make the point that ECM, ECM interactions, for example, collagen and proteoglycans, fibronectin and proteoglycan, are really important. We think a lot about cell-cell and cell ECM interactions. Um, a little less conversation is devoted to ECM, ECM interactions, but they're also very important in the function of a tissue and in the functions of the cells in that tissue. Um, so overall, this is um, the ECM is it's really critical if you're thinking about cell and tissue mechanics. It's important to consider um, how your ECM fits in. And I just encourage you all when you're um, when you're studying um, tissues or cells in artificial systems to really consider what those systems are, um, how they include the ECM, and what those systems are actually doing to the ECM because it, it likely is uh, is a major um, it's a major variable in your system. All right, so sorry, Rick, I went a couple of minutes over, but um, yeah, yeah. So, um, any questions from anyone? Yeah. As those collagen like sort of multi structures, uh, chicken wires, and yes. is, that, is the structure of those controlled by the free blankets, or is it uh, <laughs> the properties of the collagen? Um, I think it's they're self assembling for the most part. But I, I don't know how prote if, pro if and how proteoglycans would be involved. Um, let me just go to those slides, just see if I can, um, like, uh, for example, the basement membrane. Uh, the answer is I just don't know. I, I think there is there is a component of self-assembly, but um, I would guess but don't know that proteoglycans are also important. What? Yeah. So, you know, normal wound healing, um, you know, normal wound healing, the scar. Um, the, so you, you, you can't always get rid of the scar completely because it, it's, you know, it has important, um, important roles in space filling and in, you know, providing strength to the damaged tissue. One of the big holy grails in regenerative medicine is to develop ways to completely regenerate the injured tissue. Um, you know, you need the temporary scar while that regeneration is occurring, and then you want that scar to go away. It just doesn't happen in reality, and in some people more than others. Um, you know, in some people you don't have enough scar tissue formation, and you may end up with a chronic wound that's not, and you'd want it to scar over. And other people with keloid scars, you have very large and abnormal scars that are, you know, cosmetically very difficult. I mean, and in, you know, burn patients. Um, you know, those scars, scar tissue is not, um, because there's so much collagen and not, um, not elastin, it's not very, um, not very resilient, so it's very hard. Um, it's, it, it limits motility quite a bit. Um, uh, uh, but I think we don't understand enough about how, how wound healing is regulated and it, particularly what happens at, um, at the later events, how it could be broken down and how you could enhance regeneration of the underlying tissue. So, yeah, just don't know. Anyone else? Okay, Rick.